to cancer. You beat cancer by how you live, why you live, and in the manner in which you live. Stewart was very clear about who he wanted to be on TV. Appointment television because of Stuart Scott. Not one time did he think that he should be anything but himself. Oh yeah, Coop, you go girl. He was legitimately one of the most talented sportscasters out there. That was nothing though, compared to what kind of fighter he was. One of my favorite memories actually is seeing Stuart at the Super Bowl and he was going through his cancer treatments and we were just talking, checking in and he was like, I have no idea what stage cancer I'm in. I don't want to know. I am just fighting every day. I have great days. I have bad days, but I don't want to know a prognosis. And I thought, wow, man, I mean, what an attitude. What a fighter. Hi again. Thanks for letting Sports Center flow. Alongside Rich Eisen, I'm Stuart Scott. Hi, Pow. Dana. Hold up. Stuart changed the cadence and the rhythm of television, you know? The color to some degree, they were African-American broadcasters, you know, before. He wasn't the first, but, but Stuart, the way he wrote, the way he spoke. If we want to just call it what it was, he wasn't afraid to just be black, be authentically black on television and, and speak in a way that would resonate in, a, in, in that community w without any concern of if people that didn't know what it meant. Stuart brought a different audience to light because he was speaking to them in the way that they speak to themselves as sports fans at home. He's like, yo, what's up? I'm Stuart Scott. Last night, dude, joked a brother. And we're like, I said that in the barbershop yesterday. Or that's what I said when I was in school. And he said it on television. You can do that? Cool, all right. Well, you know, the brothers ain't playing baseball in the street. So he still got street cred. He just ain't got no baseball cred. Head fake one way, one dribble, some Barishnikov move in the paint, and a two-handed boof. He had the personality, clearly, but he always gave you the information. He may drop in a booyah here or something like that, but he always gave you a stat that gave you perspective on the player, the moment, the game, what have you. And that is what every good anchor reporter should do. I'm so glad it's over. <laughs> he was so confident, so able to deliver things in his own manner and style, and he absolutely never wavered from that. At the same time, he was able to go through something very difficult in his personal life, but always remain the ultimate professional. This whole fight, this journey thing is not a solo venture. This is something that requires support. The V Foundation has brought about so much awareness for the C word that I hate to say, but what the V Foundation has done, Jim Valvano from the beginning, folks afflicted with that disease, people who give the money, we're all together in this fight. Everybody in their circle of friends, it, it touches so many people. So everybody knows it, but I guess it puts, you know, a more public, a more famous, if that's the right word, face to it and name to it like Jimmy V did and Stuart did. And, and because of that, you know, you, you can, fundraise and you can raise awareness and you can you can keep people in the lab and you can keep these brilliant scientists working and working and working towards a cure towards improvement so that more people can can uh, survive what, what strikes me is this he sat on these sets right and he he was magic and and he put on a mic and he did his thing and and people remember that and booyah and blah 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 but he stood on the stage and the last time the world saw him he said his most important words, right? He gave his most powerful oration. And he was, he was a communicator, he was a performer. And that was a performance in that he was able to take whatever was destroying his body and set it aside and, and, and communicate like the gift of the clarity of his thoughts and his words. That night to see him shining on that stage and remembering what he looked like 12 hours before. It was just, the brother was a miracle. He was a walking miracle. I listened to what Jim Balvano said 21 years ago. The most poignant seven words ever uttered in any speech anywhere. Don't give up. Don't ever give up. Thank you very much.
Thank you. I can't tell you what an honor it is to even be mentioned the same breath with an author, Ash. Um, this is something I certainly will, will treasure forever. But as, as uh, was said on the tape, I, and I also I don't have one of those things going with the cue cards, so I'm going to speak longer than anybody else has spoken tonight. That, that's the way it goes. Time, time is very precious to me. I don't know how much I have left, and I have some things that I would like to say. Hopefully, at the end, I'll have something that will be uh, important to, uh, to other people, too. But I can't help it. Now, when I'm fighting cancer, everybody knows that. Uh, and people ask me all the time about how you, you go through your life and how's your day. And nothing has changed for me, as Dick said. I'm a very emotional, passionate man. I can't help it. That's being the son of Rocco and Angelina Valvano. That just comes with the territory, right? We hug, we kiss, we love. And, and when people say to me, how do you get through uh, life or, or each day is the same thing. To me, there are three things we all should do every day. If we do this every day of our life, you're going to have, what a wonderful, number one is laugh. You should laugh every day. Number two is think. You should spend some time in thought. And number three is you should have your emotions moved to tears. Could be happiness or joy. But think about it. If you laugh, you think, and you cry, that's a full day. That's a heck of a day. You do that seven days a week, you're going to have something special. And so I can't help. I rode on the plane up today with Mike Krzyzewski, my, my good friend and a wonderful coach, but people don't realize he's a 10 times better person than he is a coach. And we know he's a great coach. He's meant a lot to me in these last five or six months of my battle. But when I look at Mike, I think we competed against each other as players. I coached against him for 15 years, and I always have to think about what's important in life is to th think to me of three things, where you started, where you are, and where you're going to be. Those are the three things that I try and do every day. And you know, when I think about getting up and giving a speech, I can't help it. I have to remember the first speech I ever gave. I was coaching at Rutgers University. That was my first job. All I, oh, that's a, wonderful. And I was the freshman coach. That's when freshmen played on freshman teams. And I was so fired up about my first job. I see Lou Holtz, Coach Holtz here. What was it like the first job you had, right? The very first time you stood in the locker room to give a pep talk. That's a special place, the locker room, for a coach to give a talk. So my idol as a coach was Vince Lombardi. And I read this book called Commitment to Excellence by Vince Lombardi. And in the book, Lombardi talked about the first time he spoke before his Green Bay Packer team in the locker room. They were perennial losers. And I'm reading this. And Lombardi said he was thinking, should it be a long talk, a short talk? But he wanted to be emotional. He said, be brief. And this is what he did. He, he, normally, you get in a locker room, I don't know, 25 minutes, a half hour before the team takes the field. You do your little X and O's, and then you give the great Newt Rockney talk. We all do. Speech number 84. You pull them right out. You get, you get ready. Get your squad ready. Well, this is the first one I ever gave. And I read this thing, Lombardi. What he said was, he didn't go in. He waited. His team was wondering, where is he? Where is this great coach? He's not there. Ten minutes. He's still not there. Three minutes before they have to take the field, Lombardi comes in, bangs the door open, and I think you all remember what great presence he had, right? Great presence. And he walked in, and he just walked back and forth like this, just walked, staring at the players. And he said, all eyes on me. And I'm reading this in this book, and I'm getting a picture of this Lombardi before the, his first game. And he said, gentlemen, we will be successful this year. If you can focus on three things and three things only, your family, your religion, and the Green Bay Packers. And he like that. And the rest of it, they knocked the walls down. The rest was history. I said, that's beautiful. I'm gonna do that. Your family, your religion, and Rutgers basketball. That's it. <laughs> I had it. I'm listen, I'm 21 years old. The kids I'm coaching are 19. All right? <laughs> and I and I'm gonna be the greatest coach in the world, the next Lombardi. And I'm ready. And I'm practicing out in a right, right, right beside the locker room. The, the manager's telling me, you gotta go in. Not yet, not yet. Family, religion, Rutgers basketball. All eyes on me. I got it, I got it. And now finally he said, three minutes. I said, fine. True story. I go to knock the doors open, just like the body. Boom! It didn't open. <laughs> I almost broke my arm. I was like, you know, it was one that didn't open. Now I'm down, the players are looking. You know, coach, get, uh, help the coach up. Help him up. You know? <laughs> and now I did like Lombardi. I walked back and forth, right? And I was going like that with my arm, get the feeling back in it. And finally I said, gentlemen, 
All eyes on me. And these kids wanted to play. They're 19. Let's go. I said, gentlemen, we'll be successful this year if you can focus on three things and three things only. They said, yeah. I said, your family, your religion, and the Green Bay Packers, I told them. <laughs> I did that. I remember that. <laughs> I remember. I remember where I came from. It's so important to know where you are. And I know where I am right now. How do you go from where you are to where you want to be? And I think it, it, you have to have an enthusiasm for life. You have to have a dream, a goal. And you have to be willing to work for it. I talked about my family. My family is so important. People think I have courage. The courage of my family is my wife, Pam, my three daughters here, Nicole, Jamie, Leanne, my mom, who is right here, too. And, and, And that screen is flashing up there 30 seconds like I care about that screen right now, huh? <laughs> I, got, I, got, I got tumors all over my body. I'm worried about some guy in the back going 30 seconds, huh? You got a lot. Hey, phenomenal, buddy. Yeah, you got a lot. <laughs> all right, Dickie. Are you kidding me? Right, nuts. I got, I just got one last thing. I urge all of you all of you, to enjoy your life, the precious moments you have, to spend each day with some laughter and some thought, to get your emotions going, to be enthusiastic every day. And Ralph Waldo Emerson said, nothing great can be accomplished without enthusiasm, to keep your dreams alive in spite of problems, whatever you have, to be able to work hard for your dreams to, become, to come true, become a reality. Now I. I look at where I, I am now, and I know what I want to do. What I would like to be able to do is to spend whatever time I have left and to give and maybe some hope to others. All right, Arthur Ashe Foundation is a wonderful thing. And, and AIDS, the, the, the amount of money pouring in for AIDS is not enough, but it is significant. But if I told you it's 10 times the amount that goes in for cancer research, I also tell you that 500,000 people will die this year of cancer. And I also tell you that one in every four will be afflicted with this disease. And yet, for somehow, we seem to have put it in a little bit of the background. I want to bring it back on the front table. We need your help. I need your help. We need money for research. It may not save my life. It may save my children's lives. It may save someone you love. And it's very important. And ESPN has been so kind to support me in this endeavor and allow me to announce tonight that with ESPN's support, which means what? Their, 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 their money and their dollars and they're helping me, we are starting the Jim, Jimmy V Foundation for Cancer Research. <laughs> and, it's, and its motto is, don't give up. Don't ever give up. And that's what I'm going to try to do. Every minute that I have left, I will thank God for the day and the moment I have. And if you see me, smile and maybe give me a hug, because that's important to me too. But try, if you can, to support, whether it's AIDS or the Cancer Foundation, so that, that someone else might survive, might prosper, and might actually be cured of this dreaded disease. I can't thank ESPN enough for allowing this to happen, and I'm going to work as hard as I can you know, for cancer research, and hopefully we'll be, maybe we'll have some cures and some breakthroughs, and I'd like to think I'm going to fight my brains out to be back here again next year for the Arthur Ashe recipient. I want to give it next year. I know I've got to go. I've, I've got to go, and I've got one last thing. I've said it before, and I'm going to say it again. Cancer can take away all my physical abilities. It cannot touch my mind. It cannot touch my heart. And it cannot touch my soul. And those three things are going to carry on forever. I thank you, and God bless you all. Thank you.